The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extracts once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions from 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Alejandro. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or a short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Alejandro. Can you tell me about your problem? Doctor, over the past week, I've been getting an increased shortness of breath. I have also developed some abdominal pain. However, I was continuing my regular activities until the other day when I passed out at home. My wife called paramedics and I was brought to the emergency ward. Oh, I see. Hmm. What's your age? 35, doctor. Your diagnosis report shows bilateral pulmonary infarcts and increasing BUN and creatinine. What medication you are taking? Heparin. Do you have any past history of any renal problems? No, doctor. I was feeling completely normal until recently. What about your appetite? It's good. Any swelling in your feet or ankles? No, doctor. Do you have chest pain? No, doctor. And your bowl and bladder habits? Normal. Any sudden weight loss? No, doctor. Your blood pressure level is 130 on 170. There is no organomegaly and no peripheral edema. Your laboratory reports show hemoglobin count 14.8, white count 16.3, sodium level 133. Potassium 5.1, chloride 104, and CO2 of 19. BUN test shows 26 and creatinine level is 3.5, and earlier it was 0 0.9. The CAT scan report of your abdomen shows poor perfusion to your right kidney. I think you have acute renal failure, probably vein thrombosis. Hypercoagulable state is indicated, deep venous thrombosis with pulmonary embolism. Probably you have developed azotemia due to elevation of blood urea nitrogen, BUN, and serum creatinine levels. Your exposure to intravenous contrast materials may be the primary cause of your condition. I am going to prescribe you rivaroxaban 20 mg per day for anticoagulation. Hopefully with this anticoagulation, there will be some relief for your renal vein thrombosis. Or else, if your renal failure becomes progressive, I would advise dialytic intervention. I advise you to undergo a triple renal scintigraphy to investigate the three phases of your renal functioning system. In this diagnosis, a small amount of radioactive substance will be injected into your vein that is taken by the kidneys. 
This diagnosis involves the use of radioactive substance to investigate your kidneys and assess their function. Thank you, doctor. Extract 2 Questions from 13 to 24 you hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Zachary. For questions from 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or a short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Zachary. May I know what your problem is? I'm a patient of a gross inventoria, doctor, and I was admitted to the emergency ward of my hometown for evaluation of my disease. When did this occur? Two months back, doctor. There. My CT scan showed no hydronephrosis or upper tract process, but there was a thickening of the left and posterior bladder wall, so they referred to urology. Okay. What's your age? 65. Brief me about your past medical history. A gunshot wound in 2000, followed by exploratory laparotomy twice. What medications are you taking now? Metaprol 100 mg, Diltiazem 120 mg daily, Hydrocodone 10 out of 500 mg, Pravastatin 40 mg daily, Lisinopril 20 mg daily, Hydrochlorothiazide, 25 mg daily. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. So, I advise you to go for a bladder biopsy and a workup for a right adrenal lesion to analyze serum, cortisol, potassium, and aldosterone in ACTH level measurement. Get this completed and meet me again with the diagnosis reports. Okay, doctor. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Hello, Mr. Zachary. How are you? Have you got the diagnosis reports? I'm okay, doctor. Here are all the diagnosis reports. Hmm. The bladder biopsy confirms high-grade muscle-invasive transitional cell carcinoma with muscularis purpurea in the specimen. But the other workup seems to be totally negative. I am really sorry to inform you that the transitional cell carcinomas are really very difficult to treat. Muscle invasive carcinoma is likely to spread to other parts of the body and I have to get it treated either by removing the tumor or by treating the bladder with chemotherapy. I would suggest surgical resection of the tumor, however, the chance of reoccurrence is very common. You should undergo radical curative surgery in the form of a cystoprostatectomy with lymph node sampling. I would advise metomycin into your bladder along chemotherapy as 6 dose regimen after resection of the tumor. What is the chance for survival, doctor? Actually, I will have to treat this muscle invasive carcinoma more aggressively. Well, with your cooperation, I hope everything will go well. Sure, doctor. I will extend my full cooperation. I have full trust in your experience. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. 
Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about cutaneous manifestations. Now read the question. Cutaneous manifestations are the medical consequences of starvation, vomiting, abuse of drugs such as diuretics and laxatives, and of psychiatric morbidity. These manifestations include lanugo-like body hair, cirrhosis, carotenoderma, telogen evluvium, acne, seborrheic dermatitis, hyperpigmentation, acrocyanosis, pechicae, pernosis, livido reticularis, interdigital intertrigo, peronychia, generalized pruritus, acquired sture distente, slower wound healing, purigo pigmentosa, edema, linear arrhythmia, creleke, acral coldness, pellagra, scurvy, and acrodermatitis enteropathica. The most characteristic cutaneous sign of vomiting is knuckle calluses called Russell's sign. Symptoms arising from laxative or diuretic abuse include adverse reactions to drugs. Symptoms arising from psychiatric morbidity include the consequences of self-induced trauma. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about symptoms of anorexia nervosa. Now read the question. Multiple studies of anorexia nervosa patients have revealed a decreased left ventricular mass, cardiac output, left ventricular index, and left ventricular diastolic and systolic dimensions. Long-standing hypovolemia has also been seen in the patients. Mitral valve motion abnormalities, including mitral valve prolapse, were also seen in a distinct minority that can cause chest pain and palpitations but the ejection fraction seems to remain preserved in most patients. However, weight restoration had a significant impact in normalization of cardiac dimensions. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about endometriosis. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is a disorder when the tissue that forms the lining of uterus grows outside of the uterine cavity. It is abnormal for endometrial tissue to spread beyond the pelvic region. This condition is known as an endometrial implant. The hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle impact the displaced endometrial tissue, causing the region to become painful, inflamed, and making the tissue grow thicker and finally break down. At one stage, the broken tissue has nowhere to go and becomes trapped in the pelvis. Question 28. You hear a discussion between the physician and his nurse about treating the signs of eating disorders. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what kinds of treatment measures do you suggest for the signs caused due to eating disorders? Although skin signs of the patients with eating disorders improve as they gain weight, 
the dermatologist is responsible to treat the dermatological conditions as well. Antibacterials or azelaic acid is effective to treat acne that these may be described as monotherapy or in combinations. Combination zinc with antibacterials such as ethromycin are also suggested because zinc deficiency can be a possible cause for this sign. Angular stomatitis, sheolitis, and nail fragility can be treated with topical tocopherol. Cirrhosis improves with moisturizing ointments. Ointments that contain urea are effective in decreasing the size of Russell's sign. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a physician and his junior about pain transmission. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is the theory of pain transmission? Well, the nerve fibers that are connected to the receptors in the skin, muscles, and organs called primary afferent axons transmits the pain signals to the brain and spinal cord. These axons of various sizes may be myelinated or unmyelinated that are classified into different groups based on their size, namely A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C nerve fibers. All of the A afferent axons fibers are myelinated while C afferent axons fibers are unmyelinated. The thickness of a fiber determines the speedy transmission of information. According to the gate control theory of pain, the pain is a function to balance between the information traveling into the spinal cord through large and small nerve fibers. Small nerve fibers transmit non-susceptive information of the pain, whereas large nerve fibers carry non-nociceptive information. The large and small axon nerve fibers synapse on projection neuron cells to the brain and on inhibitory interneurons within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The firing of the projection neuron signals pain to the brain. The inhibitory interneuron decreases the chances of the firing of the projection neuron. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about subclinical seizures. Now read the question. Hello doctor, when do subclinical seizures occur? Well, subclinical seizures occur due to unusual electrical activity within the brain. Often, the symptoms are unnoticed, even by the patient. The only method to detect subclinical seizures is performing an electroencephalogram to measure the electrical activity of the brain. That can capture the seizure activity. At times, subclinical seizures are mistaken for the abnormal behavior of autistic patients. For instance, an autistic student showed good cognitive development in his studies last year. However, this year his progress has slowed down. Signs such as aggression or meltdowns were seen in the patient. He used to daydream and ignore others when anyone asked him anything. This condition was mistaken by his parents for autism. All such signs are often mistaken for behavioral issues linked with autism that can actually be connected with a subclinical seizure. According to findings, subclinical seizures may be the cause of psychiatric disorders or compulsive and behavioral disorders or even schizophrenic, criminal, and antisocial activities.
That is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors on epidermal nevi. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, doctor. Can you please explain different types of epidermal nevi? Epidermal nevi are categorized based on their clinical features, by the site of occurrence, and their extent of spread. However, mostly they are categorized based on the epidermal cell that predominates in the lesion. In certain patients, multiple epidermal nevi occur along with systemic abnormalities, and they form the epidermal nevus syndromes. Based on the occurrence patterns, epidermal nevi are categorized differently despite the similarity in their microscopic appearance. Nevus varicosus occurs as a single or multiple lesions but always localized. Nevus urineus lateris occurs as a linear pattern of lesions. Ichthyosis hystrix are generalized lesions. However, epidermal nevi are also classified by their cell of origin. Nevus sebaceous are quite common and are made up of sebaceous glands with or without hair follicles. They're found commonly on the scalp but also on the extremities or trunk and are pale yellow in color with a smooth hairless surface. They are present in infants though they may manifest only after puberty or in childhood. One fourth of the cases eventually give rise to tumors and are mostly benign. Often it is connected with the occurrence of Schimmelpenning syndrome, phacomatosis, pigmento keratotica, didymos aplastic sebacea, and scalp syndrome. Keratinocinic epidermal nevus are also called non-organoid epidermal nevi and are quite common among this group of lesions. They follow the lines of Blaschko and begin as brownish macules, thicken and darken with age to become plaques. They may be defined as linear or varicose based on their appearance. Other variants include the epidermolytic epidermal nevus, the acantholytic epidermal nevus, and the systemized epidermal nevus. Nevus comedonicus are formed of proliferated dilated keratinized follicles, often inflamed or showing signs of infection as a result of blockage, forming blackheads, and pitting is often seen. It may be associated with brain abnormalities, bone defects, and cataracts. The Angora hair nevus is remarkable for the long and soft white hair, like Angora wool, that grows from it. It may be associated with other defects of the brain and bones. 
The Becker nevus is a dark patch of hairy skin that appears like a checkerboard shape, becoming larger and darker after puberty due to androgen-dependent nature. Often it is found on the upper part of the back or on the shoulders. It is linked with other skeletal muscular defects, forming the Becker nevus syndrome. Inflammatory linear varicose epidermal nevus is linear and forms plaques, usually unilateral. They are usually pruritic and appear inflamed and hyperkeratotic. The first appearance is after six months of age. Porokeratotic eccrine nevus appears as warty keratotic papular lesions, mostly on the palms and soles, but in some cases they may appear all over the skin. Now, look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on different types of gangrene. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Can you explain different types of gangrene? Well, the term gangrene refers to the death of tissues due to lack of blood supply and deeper invasion of infected tissues, which are broadly classified into two categories, dry and wet gangrene. Although there are many types of gangrene, all types of gangrene manifest either as dry or wet form. In the dry gangrene, there is obstruction or slowing of blood flow into the organ or part of the body that is affected. Peripheral parts like toes, fingers, nose tip, earlobes, etc. are commonly involved. Often, dry gangrene is seen in patients of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, where long-term high blood sugar damages the small arteries and blood vessels that supply blood to the end parts of the body, such as fingers and toes, resulting in obstruction and slowing of blood flow and ultimately gangrene. In patients with dyslipidemia or high cholesterol, there is a risk of cholesterol deposition and lipids called plaques within the blood vessels. In the peripheries, such as fingers and toes, this leads to decrease in the blood vessel diameters by narrowing of the lumen resulting in formation of gangrene. Patients with peripheral arterial disease develop fatty acid deposits or develop narrowing of peripheral blood vessels. Certain conditions include scleroderma and Raynaud's disease, where the blood supply is restricted to leg or hand muscles resulting in gangrene. Dry gangrene is usually identified by cold, painless, and dry and shriveled up affected part. However, there will be healthy skin surrounding them. The area affected appear mummified. Wet gangrene occurs due to infection and invasion of bacteria into deeper tissues after injuries, foot ulcers, frostbites, or burns. 
there is excessive swelling of the affected part due to release of the toxins from the invading bacteria, resulting in blockage of the blood supply and worsening of the infection as the white blood cells cannot reach the area affected via blood vessels. Wet gangrene spreads much quicker than dry gangrene and may result in life-threatening complications like septic shock. Wet gangrene appears discolored or black and often with acute and excruciating pain. There are black blisters and foul-smelling pus beneath the thin skin at the area. Since the infection is associated with discharge of pus, it is called wet gangrene. Gas gangrene is caused by bacteria called clostridium that is found in spores present in the soil. Gas gangrene was a common cause of death in the wars. The gangrene is caused by the toxins released by the bacteria. Gas gangrene is further categorized into three types. Traumatic gas gangrene, occurring after injury. Non-traumatic gas gangrene. Recurrent gas gangrene, caused by C. perfringens species of bacteria. Necrotizing fasciitis is a deep tissue infection caused by bacteria like Staphylococcus or Streptococcus. The bacteria spreads deep into the skin and into the tissues and attacks the soft tissue and the fascia, which is a sheath of tissue covering the muscle. This can occur in an extremity following a minor trauma or due to the opportunity for the bacteria to enter the body, such as surgery. The necrotizing fasciitis infection, known as flesh-eating bacteria, is most common with minor trauma. A mixed bacterial infection is often the cause after surgery. Internal gangrene is caused when blood supply to an internal organ is hampered, usually by pressure from another organ or growth. For instance, in hernia, there is an abdominal opening where the intestine may get blocked and the blocked area turns gangrenous. Noma or cancrum oris affects the face. Fournier's gangrene is a rare but life-threatening condition affecting the penis and genitalia. This disease has been shown to have a predilection for patients with diabetes as well as long-term alcohol misuse. However, the disease can also affect patients with non-obvious immune compromise. The development and progression of the Fournier's gangrene is often fulminating and can quickly cause multiple organ failure and mortality. Due to such potential complications, it is crucial to diagnose the disease process as early as possible. Death rate is very high despite antibiotics and aggressive debridement and broadly accepted as the standard treatment. Mullaney's synergistic gangrene is a rare type seen in patients after surgery. Mullaney's synergistic gangrene is caused by S. aureus and streptococcus organisms. One of the recognizable symptoms is the presence of extremely painful lesions that usually form in the second week after surgery or minor trauma. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.